Tēnā koutou katoa. We meet again for another action-packed webinar. Tonight we are joined by Mel, a wound care specialist with Southern DHB. Mel has an extensive background in wound care, general and vascular surgery and intensive care. His role as a wound care specialist at Southern DHB includes the selection and evaluation of wound products and technology. Then with his other hat, he is an executive member and treasurer for the New Zealand Wound Care Society. Tonight, he's here to focus on the what, when, why, and how we use negative pressure wound therapy. Sounds very interesting. And I'm sure we'll have some lovely photos along the way to keep us entertained. <laughs> as we go along, as I say, do feel free to use your chat function to introduce yourself. And if you use your Q&A tab for any questions, and we can cover these at the end of his presentation. So let's now hand you over for tonight's webinar. Thank you. Hello, New Zealand. Good evening. Thank you so much for your interest um, uh, in um, learning more about uh, negative pressure wound therapy. So my name is Emil Schmidt. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Kathy. I'm the wound specialist for Otago, as you see it. And uh, my talk tonight, tonight will be hopefully interesting to you. I thought we were going to spend about 45, 50 minutes on um, theory a little bit and talking, so my presentation, and then we have uh, plenty of time for, for questions at the end. Um, I have the second slide here, and it looks a bit stern, but I want to just make sure that uh, people are aware that the following presentation uh, contains graphic wound photos and is intended to educate health professionals. Please use your discretion when watching it with other people. Thank you, Emil Schmidt. The reason I do that is because a number of presentations ago, somebody rang me up, a colleague from uh, out of town, and said, look, uh, we watched the, the webinar. It was great and fantastic. We watched it with our family at dinner time, and it was a, a colorectal uh, presentation, obviously with lots of wounds in it. So. Uh, feel free and use it as your discretion as you think it's appropriate in your setting. So let's get started. So the objectives for this presentation, talk a little bit about history of negative pressure, how it works, how what's the um, effect is of negative pressure uh, when we use it, some precautions and contraindications, the types of wound fillers, and then some case snippets or case scenarios. So a little bit of a history of negative pressure, just go back to about 30, 40 years when um, the uh, guy sort of Jerrica and Catherine Cheetah, they developed a, a system which is a topical negative system which used a drain and a gauze and an adhesive film to evacuate, evacuate a serious fluid from the wounds. And that's a uh, system was uh, used and described in 1989. There was the first paper really which, uh, which uh, described in a clinical fashion uh, negative, negative pressure uh, in wound care. Negative pressure has been used for hundreds of years for other purposes, for example, cupping when you go to physio and they, they put cups on you to create uh, negative pressure and also some hyperemia in the area of application. But this paper was really um, a groundbreaking paper in 1989. So we go about 30 years back. However, it took another 10 years almost until the plastic surgeons pioneers, Mori Kwas and Argenta used a foam contact layer in 1997. And their system was patented and was called vacuum assisted closure. So that's why we often say VEC, because VEC was uh, the first system which was commercially available, was uh, groundbreaking really, and a lot of the research done in the first 10 plus years was done is using this type of negative pressure. So we have to thank those people, uh, based in, uh, uh, Meru Kwas and Agenda keeps for introducing the negative pressure to the wide world. 
So in 2006, then the court ruled that other negative pressure systems could also be used without a patent infringement. That was a huge change in the whole market of negative pressure systems. Because since then, the last 15 years, uh, many, many, many different uh, negative pressure system uh, have evolved uh, throughout the world. Uh, basically, we can divide them in the one to the left with canister and the one on the right canister free. So there are many, many systems on the market around the world. There, uh, and um, as we in New Zealand, we are a small market. We mainly have two systems uh, here in New Zealand, which is the Renesis and the VEX system. The last 30 years, there have been many uh, thousands, thousands of peer-reviewed publications describing the clinical efficacy and safety of negative pressure for all wound types. So it is without doubt that it has revolutionized and changed wound practice throughout the world in that period of time. And that's why we're here tonight, because it's been used, it has been used uh, since uh, that period of time. So what is it? So negative pressure systems is an application of sub-atmospheric pressure across a wound to aid healing. So basically what you need is a suction pump to the left. Then you need to have a, a wound, a cavity wound, for example. So a cavity wound, which needs a wound filler or an interface media to suck the fluid away. Then you need an occlusive film. In a suck and a train basically connecting that the wound filler to the pump. And we talk about uh, this is basically how, how it works. Then the pump is turned on and the pump creates negative pressure. It creates a high negative pressure from the part throughout the tubing. It's setting it depends between 70 and 125 millimeters of mercury. As you can see in this picture here, the negative pressure decreases as it is transmitted through the contact material and wound tissue. This creates an area of lower negative pressure in the peripheral tissue. The resulting negative pressure gradient causes fluid to move from low to high negative pressure areas. So the black areas are the high uh, negative pressure area nearest to the suction source, and the white areas are the lower uh, negative pressure areas. So it all goes towards the drain and drains the fluid away. So here's the equipment um, uh, which we uh, use basically and how it comes uh, uh, in, the, in the clinical scenario. So we have a pump, in this case, it's a VEC pump. Um, the pump costs have come down in the last uh, 25 years heaps. They used to be uh, $40,000 per pump. Um, and now they're coming down between seven and $15,000, depending on your contract and where you buy them and which pumps you buy. So the costs have come down a lot during the years. Uh, canisters, uh, also single use, the canisters uh, are 80 to $120 uh, per, per single use. And they usually get changed once a week or when they're full. On the right side, you see a typical dressing pack uh, for negative pressure. So there's a foam inside, there's a tracking pad, and there's a drape which uh, seals the dressing off. And that's again, 80 to $120 uh, uh, per dressings. I have to say right now that there's many policies out there which guide your local uh, uh, treatment and your, your practice. So uh, these are just some examples of the negative pressure policies and guidelines we have for the Southern DHPs. So um, it's far too much to explain that it would be really boring. Uh, so I won't go into detail, but the take home message is that um, the, there will be localized uh, guidelines uh, which you have in your DHP that will differ slightly to what we do. Um, Living Cot has guidelines on negative pressure wound therapy, and we localize those from Living Cot for those who use Living Cot uh, guidelines. How does it work? 
uh, what are the biological effects of negative pressure. So it has several uh, effects on wound healing. One is the wound contraction. I will talk more about it when we do the case scenarios. But really, we know that it uh, contracts the wound. It also will remove excess fluid. It helps angiogenesis, which means new blood vessels are created through this negative pressure. Improves tissue perfusion because of the reduction in uh, edema and granulation tissue formation is the granulation tissue is the tissue you want for uh, cavity wounds. Those wounds heal through granulation tissue formation. So really it's this beefy reed tissue you want, which will fill up the wound defect and the negative pressure is very good in kickstarting uh, this effect, uh, granulation tissue formation. Reduction of edema through the negative pressure uh, is described a lot. And of course, it's a physical blockade of uh, contamina contaminators because of this film on top of it. It's a closed system. Uh, Exudate goes into the canister and uh, it's a closed system. So basically, it's sealed off from bacteria. So uh, it, uh, it, uh, it helps to prevent uh, infections. And uh, also it facilitates moist wound healing because of that closed system. It keeps the wound nice, moist, and um, not too dry, not too wet. Of course, that's all ideal. Uh, and we will talk about that in, uh, later on. So here we, just a slide when you want to look it up for later on in terms of uh, how and why we decrease the edema. Um, and you can see here a vessel, uh, a, 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 a cubic centimeter of tissue. And in a normal tissue, you've got the capillaries and the venules and an uh, arterial uh, and the, the perfusion in that area is, is very good because it's, there's no big distance between those different uh, two vessels. When you got edema, you get interstitial fluid, you get swelling and the tissue perfusion is reduced. So therefore a reduction in edema is, uh, is, uh, is beneficial for improving wound healing. Here's a good picture of uh, a wound when we talk about wound contraction, increasing granulation tissue. So on the right, you see the wound. Before it was, the, uh, before we started using negative pressure. And then on the left, and uh, you can see the healthy granulation tissue, uh, which is so beneficial for wound healing, which we need. All right. You also see at the same time, the pink area uh, from the side, which the epithelial cells basically moving in from the sides once the granulation tissue comes up to the surface. So you see the contraction on the left side, those, those uh, on the skin, how the wound uh, contracts and how the granulation tissue uh, is formed. And as I talked earlier on, the bio burden management um, uh, is, um, is very well controlled, usually under negative pressure through this increased blood flow. It provides high nutrient and oxygen levels to the wound. Also, of course, because we, we reduce the frequency of dressing changes. So we change it twice or three times a week um, under film dressing. And uh, that is uh, you know, a big change from what we used to do uh, earlier. Uh, you know, years and years ago, before we had negative pressure. However, in bold here, this is not a substitute for thorough or repeated debridement. Wounds must be debrided prior to commencing this therapy. And uh, uh, I encourage anyone to look on webinars and look into the importance of debridement, uh, which is not covered in this uh, presentation today, simply because of time reasons. But this is most, most important. As if a treatment you start, you have to have a goal. So what do you want to achieve? Well, to achieve wound closure, either by secondary intention or surgical closure. Uh, we never use negative pressure for complete healing of the wound. We set a, we set a, a, a certain uh, endpoint. We want to reduce the size, for example, of the wound. We want to start, kickstart the wound with granulation tissue formation. Um, and then as soon as we can, 
uh, because it's still a costly uh, procedure, uh, we will change to alternative wound dressings. And that's perfectly all right. Of course, if the uh, wound stagnates, not, uh, not improves, uh, if the wound deteriorates, then we need to think about uh, uh, other uh, options. And I'll talk about that more too. Some of this improving patient quality of life and patient comfort is really important. And again, I talk about that more in terms of discharge planning and uh, people able to go back to work uh, very, very early in, the, in their journey. When do we stop or change the treatment? So as mentioned earlier on, uh, if the uh, granulation tissue in the wound bed has achieved the aim of the therapy, so if it comes to the surface, then we stop it. Or even before that, if we can uh, use a different type of treatment. Or if the patient's not tolerating the treatment, or of course, withdraws the consent for therapy. And that can happen. Very rarely is the patient complains of severe pain and we have to change it because of that, um, of that reason. If there's excessive bleeding, then we have to stop uh, the negative pressure. And if there are signs of local spreading infection, for example, odor. On this picture on the, on the right side, on the bottom, you can see how the tracking, how the uh, soft port or the, uh, on, the, on the dressing changes color. So if that changes color, there's a sign, there's a certain bacteria, it could be Pseudomonas underneath. If the wound is odorous, it starts to get smelly. We have a protocol that we stop the negative pressure and uh, get in uh, and use um, other antimicrobials and get on top of this odor first before we uh, continue or restart the negative pressure dressings. So, so when do we use it? When do we use negative pressure? There's a wide, a broad variety of indications. So one of the most important one is for surgical wound dehiscence. Or, you know, that's basically where it, where it started, including pressure injuries. It then moved on to using it for split skin grafts, where we hold the grafts more in place and make sure that they have a, a good survival rate. And also trauma and reconstructive surgery um, is used heaps and heaps. It has changed um, that field uh, in the last 30 years completely. There's an application for venous legosis, and we use it for diabetes-related uh, foot ulcers. So just um, the reason why we use it for surgical wound dehiscence, and on the right, you see an abdominal dehisced wound uh, with a, a colostomy attached to it. Um, as we said earlier on, it reduces the complexity of the wound. Uh, we use a wound filler to reuse, reduce the deep space, manage the wound exudate, and we need to be aware that we will, uh, we will stop it if there's complications like odor. And often it's, uh, we might try to use it for if there's a secondary closure or delayed closure available, um, and, uh, and that would be a good outcome. Unfortunately, it's not often the case. Some principles of surgical wound dehiscence before we talk about um, applying negative pressure systems. So when you get a cavity wound, we need to apply a dressing or a device which is appropriate for the exudate level. You've got a cavity, a cavity, you need to understand the cavity. You need to know exactly the size, the depths, are there any sinuses, are there any undermined areas, um, are there any hidden uh, corners in the wound, so to speak? So you need to have a really good understanding because all those areas must be filled with a wound filler. And we need to count the numbers of dressings and document clearly uh, how many pieces are in the wound. So as a good principle is what goes into the wound must come out of again. So what you put in, you must take out again. So, you know, uh, how many pieces you take out if you put five pieces in, Casey? Five. So you put five. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay. 
So I always do a bit of a joke because uh, it is important. It is not funny, actually, if you've got a retained dressing, which uh, then uh, you discover, the patient discovers after a few months gets an abscess, it needs to be uh, opened up and there's a retained dressing. And unfortunately, that can happen and it's absolutely a disaster. So always have to be aware of the risk of retained dressings. And you have to have a protocol in uh, your area of practice uh, to, uh, to guide people of how to document that. And actually that is not that easy. Uh, and we have done a, a survey within the Wunker Society and there is no standard practice where we document it. Is it in the notes? Is it after theater? Is it on top of the dressing and so forth? So, we haven't got it yet. We have not got the right answer for that yet. Uh, I, we put it in a wound care plan. Uh, some people put it on the dressings. We have to document completely that I, five pieces were put in, five were taken out. If you can't find one, you need to alert it and make sure that we inspect it uh, fully. So that's just some principles for surgical wound dehiscence. Now, we talked about wound filler. So wound filler for negative pressure. There are basically two wound fillers which are used, gauze and foam. And you can use them both uh, for cavity or undermined area. Both uh, have uh, flexibility to treat a, right, uh, a wide range of wounds. Um, foam is more suitable for highly exudating and deep sinuses wounds. That's my experience and also uh, feedback I get from other colleagues. Uh, of course, gauze might be less painful and it's easier to apply. You don't have to cut the foam into pieces and know about that later on. You can see the gauze is more uh, applicable here on this, uh, uh, on this diagram. It goes in the nooks and crannies of a wound easier than the foam, which is stiffer and uh, it's uh, not going into those areas sometimes where we want it to be. Um, uh, has disadvantages and advantages each, each of them. The dressing change for gauze is twice a week and for foam is three times a week. So I quite like that uh, diagram on the right where you talk about wound exudate levels and you've got the gauze, the blue and the foam, the green arrows, and you can see the exudate level from low to high. So foam is able to use it from low to high and can deal with this sort of uh, exudate very nicely. The foam is like an open structure. If you cut it, you look through the light, you can see how it stays open. It stays open under pressure too. So it can deal with exudate and, and uh, uh, the tenacity of the slough much better than gauze. Where gauze is cotton. So the cotton fibers of the gauze, uh, when you squeeze them or when you put them under pressure, they become like a, uh, like a you know, they're very tight. So the fluid has to go through the tight cotton fibers uh, into the, and it takes um, uh, ages to, to go through to th that one. And sometimes if it's too dry and too tenacious, um, it will not uh, make it. So, and then you do the dressing change. You can see that the wound has not progressed to the level of what you would have hoped. Um, so it's more like from low to, to, to medium wounds. The pain and discomfort level, certainly the gauze is less painful. Uh, foam can be painful because it's, uh, it sort of adheres to the wound bead more. Uh, we have had foam for, you know, for 10, 12, 13 years, we only had foam. And uh, a lot of it is technique, uh, how you do it in terms of dressing change and prepare the patient for dressing change to reduce the amount of pain. But um, we haven't got, haven't really got time to get into that. So matching wound type and device. So negative pressure wound therapy, this canister on the left side. So these are deep and large wounds, cavity wounds, highly exudating. And then on the right side, you've got negative pressure systems as our canister. So you can see, you know, topical negative pressure to prevent the hissens. You can see a leg ulcer, um, a healing leg ulcer. Uh, you can see a skin graft, uh, which is so, uh, perfect for applying topical negative pressure if you wish to have them. Now comes one of my most treasured uh, pictures in my career. 
So I'm very proud of this because uh, most of you young practitioners out there will not have seen that. And uh, you can see on my glasses that I'm getting out, but uh, I'll show you this because that's what happened before we had uh, negative pressure. So before we had negative pressure about 20 years ago plus, we had this type of arrangement and every arrangement was unique. So we had an open abdomen here uh, after gastric uh, so, uh, surgery and uh, infection and the histones of the wound was left open in theater and so forth. So you can see a lot of drapes there, a bowel bag, you can see a ostomy bag, you can see at the at six o'clock, you can see combine, it's already leaking. Um, there's an e, uh, ET tube, so from uh, endotracheal tube attached to the uh, elastoplast to reduce the tension on the wound. You can see in the wound some gauze, which is iodine soaked, all right? And we had to change that um, sometimes every two hours. Okay, so frequently, uh, twice a day more, was painful for the patient, uh, lots of nursing time, extended uh, hospital stays for weeks to months. It was highly costly. Uh, so that dressing, uh, we, we used to quite frequently in ICU or the surgical ward uh, before we had negative pressure. So I'll show you the wound because at the same time, this was done at the weekend by a registrar in theater and he was very proud of it because he said, Emil, have a look what I've done. We didn't have any negative pressure pumps available. So uh, he, he put that on and I thought, fantastic. He did a really good job. Of course, we very quickly organized a negative pressure pump and I'll show you the wound, uh, what it really looks like um, under all this. So very briefly, we go through that. You can see the open abdomen. You can see the mesh in place, which basically holds the gut in. Uh, you can see some loose mesh. You can see uh, undermining um, loose mesh on 12 o'clock at seven o'clock. And you can see a sinus eight centimeter deep. All right, and another sinus is five centimeter deep. So those sinuses need to be filled with a wound filler. So you can see already a foam in place, uh, which is, uh, I don't know why they make this foam black. If anybody out there in the country can tell me why they make this foam black and not a different color so you can see it better in the wound, I would be useful. So please let me know. So this is a large abdominal wound. The foam in itself is applied here in the sinuses and then in the undermined areas, so you've got pieces. So you count the pieces, one, two, three. Then you put a piece in the middle and at the same time, I always teach you try to reduce the uh, size of the wound. So look at that. So surrounding skin is covered with a skin barrier. In this case, it's a hydrocolloid or comfy, for example, could be something else. Okay, so you got that covered. We do not use an intermittent layer of cuticerin on this. For example, we use it directly onto the mesh uh, because it was such a highly accelerating wound anyway. So the wound is on the left, 30 centimeters wide, then in the middle, and then on the right, you, uh, the patient helped to reduce the size of the wound. Then we put the drape on and the negative pressure pump on top. So what you can see on the left, 30 centimeters, on the right, six centimeters, you can see already how the wound is contracting and how the size of the wound is reduced uh, immediately with the first dressing in place. And also you can imagine what the, uh, 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 reduction edema is. Uh, often what we use for this set is we use an abdominal binder to uh, keep um, the tension of the wound even more. So then we have six pieces. So how many pieces we put in? Okay, so what we must take out is six pieces. So don't forget those pieces in the sinuses, all right? And make sure they stick out at least three centimeters so you can see them. Because if you forget them, so now everybody else will forget them, I promise. So of course, uh, see the difference here, the, the, this, you know, the difference and we change this pressing three times per week. Uh, uh, and then, uh, or we, if you use scores for this, we would never use scores, we change it twice a week. Gauze has a antimicrobial in it. So that's the reason why we only change it twice a week as a rule. We have to set standard practice rules because we've got about 3,000 nurses we need to educate 
And uh, it's important that we have stick to a, a good standard. So form is always Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and course is Monday and Thursday. Right. So here we are. I've got another photo, which is a, a, a cool one, because it uh, shows you a necrotizing fasciitis dressing before we use negative pressure. So this chap uh, had necrotizing fasciitis uh, type bacteria on the left side. The pelvis was in theater, big washout and cleanage and uh, down to the muscle, as you can see. He came back from theater with a drainage and corrugated uh, eye uh, drainage. Uh, uh, drain in there. You see that the back picture and uh, latex drains are two drains, uh, three or four drains, or five here. My goodness, doesn't stop. And then shoe laces. They're called shoe laces. I'm not sure if you anyone seen like this, but this is how we, uh, the surgeon, uh, try to reduce the tension on the wound. And you can see on the lower picture uh, how that sh those shoe laces uh, cut into the muscle. Uh, so that was uh, basically how the patient came back from theater. There was a time when we introduced negative pressure. Um, and uh, I'll show you now what we did. Very quickly, we reduced most of the, we took most of the trains out. We put an intermittent layer on this and we put a negative pressure dressing on. All right, the drain was incorporated. They came out very quickly as soon as we had, as soon as we had permission from the surgeon. You can see also here protection of the surrounding skin uh, through a contact barrier. And here is uh, the same wound after the second negative pressure change. So a huge improvement um, uh, using negative pressure systems. So of course, it, this was the foam for larger wounds and this is the gauze as wound filler. So we use gauze on this patient here she crashed her, her bike on the beach, driving her motorbike. Um, she came in uh, to, with a laceration of forearm, grossly contaminated with sand. She, she had no tendon injuries or nerve damage or fractures. It's just unbelievable. I was with the surgeons in, um, in theater, uh, the plastics team, on how they took every grain of sand out of the wound, washed it all out. And of course, you can see all the tendons and the nerves and everything uh, visible. So it was just the time when we had uh, tried out uh, the gauze systems. And uh, you can see it's uh, way before we had uh, new uh, tracking pads, all right? And uh, it was quite cumbersome to apply, but it, uh, it performed really well on that wound. And the patient was discharged after split skin graft after a short period of time. So it did really well, pain wasn't an issue, and there was no problem with, with any of the underlying structure of the wound. And that was encouraging. So when you have tricky areas like uh, this groin and abdominal abscess here, we also uh, tend to use um, uh, a gauze. Uh, it's, it's, for this area, it was uh, very good because pain was an issue there, uh, and it performed very well. I wanted to talk to you about the bridging technique a little bit here. Um, so we do use negative pressure as an early uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, choice for deep stage three and uh, stage four pressure injuries. Of course, the debridement of the necrotic tissue needs to be done prior to the use. So this is a, a patient who was in ICU and developed a stage uh, three pressure injury with a sinus. Um, and uh, he couldn't be turned because he was so in, uh, unstable. Uh, we all hardly ever turned. So he developed uh, nasty pressure injuries in several, uh, uh, several areas of his body. So I'll show you a dressing, um, a breaching technique, which we used to, uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure that the breaking pad is not on the area where it's lying on. So we cut those. Uh, foams and pieces. And that's where the uh, patient uh, has a pressure injury on the sacrum area. And we bridge it from the sacrum area right to the abdominal uh, ear flank uh, in a, uh, and have the tracking pad there. So really the take home message is 
that you, the, the bridging is a really good um, uh, of a technique to use for making sure that um, that you can combine uh, several wounds into one wound, or, or that you make sure that the patient's not lying on the tracking pad. When you use the foam, obviously, you need to uh, also assure that uh, the foam is not sitting on the uh, skin, so it's covered by a barrier. We usually use a thin hydrocolloid film to use that, or you could use the drape. Otherwise, it's, the foam is a bit harsh, it excoriates the skin, and it feels it's painful, and it uh, looks like a burn. There's another wound here, which is an abdominal dehist wound, which is, um, shows you the uh, stoma. The stoma is here, was recited to the left side at, at three o'clock. Nine o'clock is the old stoma. So we just fill it up with a wound filler, foam in this case, and combine those wounds together into one. Similar here, uh, after uh, appendicitis and abdominal washout, um, we um, very quickly take those um, latex strands out. They're usually just flat in the wind anyway, they're two or three centimeters deep. Then we apply negative pressure systems and combine, combine those, um, uh, those wounds. However, sometimes it's not so easy. So if you do bridging, you have to make sure that, um, that those foam pieces have good contact. So on this photo, you can see that, see that uh, the bridging uh, on the wound uh, is working, but only just because um, if you look at the top of the main wound, the bridging part is only connected maybe by a half a centimeter. It's still working, which is pretty good, but, uh, but uh, not very well. So the connection to the main wound or the bridging needs to be really, really well done. So just some, some caution here, um, when you um, use foam, foam is uh, trickier to apply than gauze, there's no doubt about it, it needs to be cut. Let's go back to the cavity wounds now, where we uh, talk about that all, all the uh, wound needs to be in all the uh, undermined areas and the sinuses need to be covered with a wound filler. So here, where the foam was applied, you can see the whole extent of the wound. You can see the foam only covers about 60, 70% of the wound. And where the circle is, there's a, you can see the granulation tissue and also an intermittent layer um, on top of the wound, but there's no foam. There is no action. There's no negative pressure uh, applied in that area. So when you take the dressing off on the right side, you can see actually the shiny uh, area here. That's where there was no negative pressure uh, foam there. It's a soap. It's, I always say it's a soupy mess, all right? It's a breeding ground for bacteria, and there's just nothing happening. It's unhealthy. Whereas uh, the rest of the wound, you can see how the foam creates this bright red granulation tissue, uh, which is, you know, that's why I always say also to colleagues, colleagues when, I, when we teach, you know, you can see how effective your negative pressure dressing is. You're using a, a, a system which costs you hundreds of dollars a month, a week, and uh, make sure that you get the best for your buck. So you can see if you assess that wound here now, it wasn't effective, all right? So, okay, improve your technique, all right? However, there are more problems here. I'm not sure I give you, I give you five and a half seconds to have a look at that photo on the right to see and can you spot any other problems. You have a look and I'm gonna take a sip of tea and then I tell you. Okay, so. Okay, so when you look closely, or when you cut the foam, you always teach that you have to cut the foam away from the patient. Okay, you cut the foam away from the patient, uh, maybe over um, maybe over a plastic bag, uh, wherever you cut it and clean it, and you run your hands uh, at the edges of the foam to make sure 
that you got no uh, foreign bodies or no aliens in the wound. Because if you look closely here now, you can see some black uh, parts, uh, some black pieces of foam left in the wound. Uh, and there I can see at least six, seven, eight. All right, these are foreign bodies. These are healing in very quickly. And um, hopefully they won't cause any problems, but they can be the source of abscesses and of uh, delayed healing. So really important that you take care when you use uh, foam as a wound filler and uh, be aware of the, uh, you know, of the, of the application and do it, uh, do it as you've been told, as you've been taught. All right. So um, very important. Um, other thing is here, there's a split skin graft and foam. This was a basal cell carcinoma on a calf wound that the, the doctors did a very good job as a registrar, I remember, which is excising the BCC um, and put a split skin graft on. So uh, I'll leave you that to have a look at it. You can see the wound, which was excised. You then can see the foam at the back and uh, in the intermittent layer, all right? And what you can see on top of the interlayer, intermittent layer is the skin graft. But that's the skin graft which should be on the wound and not on the dressing. So we lost the whole, we lost the, the skin graft completely because it wasn't taken off uh, appropriately, okay? It wasn't soaked off and gently enough to um, remove the foam from the, from the very fragile skin graft. You can see on the right on the small on the smaller wound the skin graft still in place, okay. But that was very um, very embarrassing for the registrar. Thankfully, he did the dressing himself, uh, so he should have asked. All right. Anyway, okay. So we now talk about canister free. The last five to seven minutes. So we got we we got this canisters out of the way. Those highly exudating wounds. Okay, um, we downgrade those very quickly as soon as we can and use alternative options. Either we use alternative wound dressings or we go to canister free uh, dressings, which are now more and more available, uh, as you could see. Every company uh, does develop some, uh, and we have at least, we have a number of topical of negative pressure wound system without canisters on the market in New Zealand. I'll just show you one here, the PICO, one which we have, I have the most experience with. Um, it's constructed without an exercise canister, so that makes sense. It's lightweight, it's uh, disposable after seven days. It simplifies negative pressure. The principles are the same. There's a pump, it sucks it away, uh, uh, but it goes into a, a dressing. And it's a set pressure of minus 80. So I, I'm quite flabbergasted by the way they develop those uh, dressings. I love it actually, because the, the, the moisture transfer rate of those dressings are enormous. There's an airlock layer in, and those dressings can um, leave the exudate out, and there's uh, the basically uh, the vapor, the water vapor passes through those layers of dressings and evaporate, all right? So only the crystals basically get stuck in the wound itself. Only the hard bits get stuck in the wound. And that's why they can take up to two, 300 mils of dressings depending on the size. So most of the 80% of the uh, uh, exudate is evaporating, which is basically water, depending on the tenacity of the uh, slough evaporates through the dressing into the atmosphere. Important then not to put an adhesive or not to occlude the negative pressure uh, dressing uh, too much. So we use topical negative pressure to prevent dehiscence. And I guess this is one, if you use it, where uh, probably the most uh, used application still is. Um, we have a protocol of uh, people, of uh, mothers with um, a high risk uh, wound dehiscence. So um, here is a patient uh, which was one of our 
earlier, about three, about four years ago, we changed our protocol for C-sections. We had a run of really nasty uh, infections on the very large wounds that they get, um, if, the, if C-sections get infected, that it is, and there are huge wounds. I mean, uh, huge um, cavity wounds. So we needed to do something. We put a bundle in place of changing the, the skin uh, prep and in theater, I reviewed the, uh, the, 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 the the stitching technique and so forth, but also uh, had a, a plan in place that we use uh, topical negative pressure immediately in theater applied um, after C-section. So this is a wound of a C-section with a high-risk patient. She had a previous wound to her since has a BMI of 55 uh, and diabetes. So you can see here, there was also a drain, a subcutaneous drain to drain more fluid off in the deeper tissue applied in the wound. And the wound healed uh, very, very nicely, as you can see here a week um, after, after the dressing was taken off. So this is a topical, um, pretty much in, in, in uh, obstetrics, we have this in place. We don't use it a whole lot for other orthopedics and so forth. The jury is still out if we want to introduce it there. We do use top uh, negative pressure uh, free uh, canisters uh, for other wounds. For example, here's a legal wound, which is um, it's, it's, uh, it's suitable for this type of application. I mean, it is a very nice small um, device, we can apply it on the lower limb. And also we can apply it then with compression bandaging like on this um, lady here who was um, in her mid eighties where we applied compression bandaging on both of her lower leg wounds after ultrasound debridement. And um, she coped very well with this. As you can see, there is no bulky machine attached to it. So here are the more recent developments, uh, which um, uh, have, we have used some of it, like for example, on the left is a Vera flow in still. So this is a machine which applies negative pressure, but also allows us to uh, um, flush the wound uh, intermittently um, with uh, any fluid you like, really. It could be saline, it could be promptazine, and we apply that, uh, there's a, a meshed foam there, uh, goes directly to the wound bead. Uh, we're setting it in terms of instill. Um, that's why it's called instill. So you instill the fluid for a certain amount of time, say 20 minutes, uh, 50 mils of, of prontosin, leave it in that wound to quell. And then uh, after 10 minutes, it gets sucked away and then standard negative pressure uh, is applied. It works, so we have done a case series. Rebecca Abern has done a case series on it. It's an interesting concept. It's a concept which is used within the hospital. It can't be used at home as far as we, uh, we certainly wouldn't fit into our setup at the moment. Uh, so that's, that's promising. Um, on the other side is um, just show you the PICO development. Um, but people develop other devices like Brevina and, um, and other spring-loaded devices, even without batteries. These uh, uh, PICO systems are battery powered, so they're disposable. They're about they're 200, depending on your contract, 200 to, 50, 200 to $250 per week, all right? And um, so it's significantly uh, cheaper than standard negative pressure and more convenient for the patient. The whole negative pressure system is the early discharge. People go to work very early, uh, you know, get the dressing changes done. With those systems are similar. There's a second dressing in the pack, which can be changed, uh, you know, twice a week if there's a need for that. One which I haven't used uh, and I just discovered is the Pico 7Y. I'm not sure if that's on the market in New Zealand. Um, but it shows quite nicely because we use a Y piece for negative pressure risk canister wounds, um, which are, you know, two or three different types of wounds. Uh, although we have a, 
stay there. So we also only use it for heart to heal wounds and not, uh, so we wouldn't combine an acute surgery with the histones with a lower leg liver wound, which has been in place for six months. All right. So the origin of the wound needs to be the same or similar. And then we use Y pieces where you can use two, uh, system, two dressings with one machine. So that's pretty cool. I uh, haven't seen that one here. The new one which we're trialing at the moment is Pico 14. So this is a system, the pump is more advanced. Um, the pump is stronger. We can use it for deeper sinuses, for deeper wounds. And so they go down to five, six centimeters. Um, it's just got a stronger motor in it, basically, a stronger um, system. It can be left in place for up to a fortnight. Uh, the, again, dressing changes um, uh, can be applied, all right. And uh, we're doing a case series on uh, uh, groin, uh, groin, di groin dissection after vascular surgery. So we, we just, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept too. So basically what I just wanted to show is that this sort of type of um, negative pressure um, systems are developing all the time. They're hopefully getting simpler to use. They're more patient friendly. It's all about flexibility. It's all about uh, people um, can use it easily. They can go their normal, normal way at home. And, uh, you know, uh, people don't, uh, um, don't find it uh, you know, uh, too cumbersome to use that pump at home. Because even those canister pumps, which are smaller, those portable ones can be a, you know, quite a risky to use for an aged person who is quite fragile and there's a risk of falls. And we want to uh, avoid those. So the last uh, slide is really just a, a show that um, if you want to apply negative pressure systems, you should have a competency, you should have an education program. This is our uh, wound study days we do once a month. Uh, we have two, two options. One is uh, the competency part of it, so is option one. So there's a negative pressure system com uh, competency and a compression managing competencies. And that's what we basically do. The people have to uh, do a workbook and answer questions and everything else. And then they have to be observed and they do dressings and to make sure that we apply uh, that uh, system um, in a safe way and in a cost-effective way. And on the right side, just the guidelines which I alluded uh, earlier on. So this is hopefully was of, any, of use to you guys out there. Um, I'm now happy to take questions. Oh, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Love the pictures. Thank you. <laughs> I had an early tea. I was organized for you, you say. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> cool. And so just, so just a few wee comments before we get into the questions for you. There was just there was a few people coming out with nice memory remarks about remembering that previous dressing too before we had the actual <laughs> negative pressure wound therapy. So you've, you've got some colleagues out there who remember them as well. And there was one lady that even recalls, just says that prior to the pumps, they attached the drain to the wall suction. So I don't know if yeah. you've done that one. <laughs> you know, that's, that's correct. We've done that actually uh, at the same time. I was charged as <laughs> in 2000 in the, on the general surgical board when we started using VEX. And uh, there was a fourth floor, the general surgical floor, floor on the orthopedic floor, they still use for at least a year or two uh, the suction wall and the dressings they developed. Yeah. So there's a lot of that stuff, I guess, was getting all was uh, was happening before those two plastic surgeons in the States um, basically made uh, systems which became commercially available and safe to use. Uh, you know, we're all creative and we all do it all the time and we make the best of what we have. And uh, yeah, yeah, we did use it. Yeah, I remember that very well. All right, here's some questions then. Let's pick your brain. So we've got 
what was the length of time for the abdominal dehiscence when you showed at the start to go from 30 centimeters down to six centimeters? What was the time frame that that took? Well, that's, um, that's basically 10 minutes or 15, 20 minutes, however long the dressing took. I just wanted to show that, uh, and I teach it all the time uh, with cavity wounds, that you can, that, that basically was the same 15, 20 minutes later, the same patient on the same day, just the dressing put in place, pushing the wound edges together and reducing at the same time the amount, the, the, the size of the wound. Okay, so the wound when it opens up won't be six centimeters, it will be whatever, 15, 20 or whatever. It takes time, but what the take home message is, always, always try with every dressing to reduce the size of the wound. So when you have a sinus, you sinus six centimeter deep, you fill it with foam, for example, but you don't fill it down to the bottom. You leave a little bit so the wound can actually grow in because that suction, okay, creates cell deformation and fancy stuff, which basically leads to granulation tissue formation. If you have it completely tightly filled, the wound will not uh, uh, heal as fast as. So I teach it all the time, reduce the size of the wound. And it's part of a recognized, uh, uh, a recognized uh, positive effect of negative pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you use negative pressure wound therapy in the palliative setting? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, want, I had it in, but I took it out. I mean, how much do you put in and how much you take out? Yes. So we do use it. So malignancy is a contraindication for negative pressure because you don't want to create granulation and more, you know, cell divisions. But yes, we have used it um, on occasions on palliative wounds because it deals very well with the odor. So the odor often is uncontroll uncontrollable, often, almost. Um, and also the exudate levels that we use it for, I can remember very well, a fungating uh, abdominal wound um, where we used it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And it's very, very... Uh, um, it's a very effective if uh, if the if everybody agrees on it, you know, like in terms of uh, uh, patients, family, caregiving team, and funding. So this is a good one too. So does the compression bandaging still allow the fecal to work, as you said about the evaporation of fluid through the dressing? I knew that would happen. <laughs> Um, I knew that question would come up. And yes, we, we discussed it as the manufacturer. We can do that. The uh, compression, yes, it works. So the, compre it, the, the compression bandage is not, it breathes, okay? Uh, it's not uh, occlusive. So it's not like you put, like if you would put another upside or two on top or drape on top of the uh, pickle or the topic of negative pressure, there would be a difference. But the compression bandaging, still allows the skin to breathe and the dressing to evaporate. We haven't seen any negative effect on it. It still works. I mean, the, those wounds you're using, these little devices are not highly exudating wounds. So it won't sort of exudate liters and liters over hours. You know, it's over 24, 48 hours, uh, 72 hours, 100 to 200 mils. That slowly evaporates, that slowly goes through the compression bandaging. And by the way, the compression bandaging gets changed often twice a week too. So yeah, we can use it and uh, we haven't had any negative effect on it. All right, so for the bridging technique, is that only to be utilized with foam or can gauze be used as well? Oh no, absolutely. Gauze can be used as well, definitely. Definitely. I mean, gauze is uh, a great wound filler for the right wound, and it definitely can be used. The same system, you just protect the, the skin underneath, um, you know, and then uh, build your bridge. You know, I always feel like a build a bridge over the autobahn, you know, just go for it. <laughs> and then, so cutis use under foam is not always necessary. 
No, I know. No, no, and I uh, we discussed it. We had a study there on Monday. One of this com uh, uh, competency study days. We do not use QTCN uh, on um, as a, as a rule on a phone. I never have. We have we used it for 10, 13 years and never did. We used it if, for example, pain was an issue. All right, but not as a standard rule. And uh, I asked the um, uh, the the rep on Monday, and um, the answer was that they leave it up to the individual uh, practitioners, obviously, which is uh, useful. So no, we don't because whenever you use an intermittent layer you reduce the effectiveness of the, of the system. I mean, why do you want to use foam? Because it creates granulation tissue. It's really creates its fibers. If you use another intermittent layer, then you reduce the effectiveness. You um, also have another piece of uh, equipment which can get lost in the system. Uh, so that can create a risk. Uh, wounds are on the whole not uh, not flat or anything, you know, they have nooks and crannies where they can get lost. So no. So if pain becomes an issue with foam, we uh, we have systems and, and techniques, for example, reduce the amount of, uh, of pressure. The changing technique is really important. Um, and we, we just see it on Monday again is, for example, yes, we say stop the negative pressure at least half an hour. So that, but it's also important not just to stop it, but to release the tension of the tubing. So the foam, when you look at the foam, can really expand again. All right, the foam sucks in um, and it stays sucked if you only turn the pump off. You need to disconnect the pump, uh, the tubing, and let the, the, the foam relax. And then what we do, we cut a hole in the, in the, in the drape and I use ampules of saline, 20 mil saline, because you need pressure to put that saline into the foam. So use four or five of those ampules, push it into the foam, put a little bit of tripe on top of it so you seal it. And then I will say, walk away. Okay, walk away and do something else. All right, so do something else. The nurse in the hospital, do something else. Always busy, leave the patient alone. Okay, come back in an hour's time. In that hour time, the foam has released its tension on the wound bead, all right? And usually that does do the trick. So that's more the technique where people uh, have, uh, might have uh, sort of problems with. Yep, we, I know if really everything else fails, you use an intermittent layer. In the past, we also used uh, silokine. Uh, infiltrated into the foam when it really becomes, but very, very rarely, or maybe once or twice in all those times. Uh, and of course, if it's an issue with, and you can't resolve uh, adequate pain relief um, uh, for these patients today, which is a stage four pressure injury, huge, very, you know, pain was a real issue uh, for many reasons, not because of the wound, but just get the pain team involved. Uh, we needed to use foam because the wound is decreasing in size, all right? And um, we got the pain team involved, we use Antonox uh, and we, it works quite well. So use techniques, you know, uh, which you can, uh, all about is the effectiveness of the treatment. Uh, don't reduce it uh, because you want to get the best outcome for the patient. All right then, and then we've got, so we've got someone now who's got a wound, 1.5 centimeters long, one, oh, so, yeah, then half a centimeter wide, half a centimeter deep on the medial knee. They're using a uh, renaissance with foam due to the amount of exudate, and it fills a canister in two days, possibly more due to the lymphedema in the lower limb. And they're a bit concerned about the waste of dressings, but they've been discouraged from using PICO because of the amount of exudate. Do you have any <coughs> advice or suggestions for them? I'd love to. Uh, um, okay. 
So first of all, you need to think about, it. well, first of all, we need to exclude any underlying structural problems. You know, is, is there any, any, is there any bone involvement? Is there any, any other problems underneath? So working with, with um, colleagues together, orthopedics or x-rays and make sure that it's all covered, all right? But no underlying issues like a foreign body, which drives the whole problem. So you need to look at the wound bleed itself as it's inflamed, cellulitic. Why is it oozing so much? A bit unusual, all right? So um, so Pico would not be dealing with that uh, fluid. Um, I hear the edema on the lower limb. So if it's appropriate, we could um, start um, using uh, compression bandaging and compression bandaging um, using it for above knee. So we start from the lower, you know, on the base of the of your assessment, obviously. And if it's appropriate and possible, we believe are very much in, in, in compression. Um, and that makes a big difference in terms of dealing with that um, uh, with, uh, fluid. So that would be an option excluding any underlying or other issues you might have not uh, thought of. So go back to the patient's uh, history and, and journey and uh, understand that completely. Have you missed anything? Is there any referrals you can ask other people from I as a wound specialist? Do that. Um, and then uh, now my, if that's everything is fine, I would strongly think about compression. If you can't do compression bandaging, uh, even above knee stockings could help, will help, not could help, will help. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, any tips or tricks to achieve a solid seal on deep cavities, pressure wounds that are close to the gluteal cleft? Um, yes, they, um, well, I know the problem, believe me. All right, so I'm not try to tell you that is very easy and maybe you have used everything uh, what I just tell you now. So every company has a double-sided uh, tape uh, on the mar in their in their stocking list. So it's a very sticky uh, tape which is uh, like a gel tape and uh, it sticks extremely well to these areas here. Um, and that can be very useful. I have used that. What's really most important is, um, I find, two things. One, you need to make sure that the skin is completely dry. So you need to defect the area there where you want to uh, put that the gel, the strip. Uh, so I use, um, in this case, I use um, Friar's Balm. Uh, all right. Again, an old fashioned stuff. All right. It's we really highly percentage of alcohol and it just dries the skin out in no time. Uh, it cannot go into the wound, it's, it will be bloody painful. All right, so you dry the skin, stretch it, and uh, you might need, an, uh, might need a helper there and put the gel strip on and make sure it's all dry and then put the uh, drape on top of it. I also find that in this case, bridging is a really good technique to use. The tracking pad, depending on the company is whatever, but the tracking pad is often in the way and is too, too tense and causes a uh, problem. So I find bridging it away from the area, which is fragile, we do that a lot. So we do that for toes, for uh, four feet, uh, negative pressure dressings, for all those tricky areas, we like bridging a lot and have and seem to have success with it. Um, anything else? No. Oh, well, and obviously, um, hopefully the patient is um, not incontinent because that's really the tricky part of it. People then are incontinent. Um, that makes it a real problem. Yeah. So those chest strips are useful, um, dry skin, um, and uh, it. Oh, you're just riddled with knowledge, you are, aren't you? <laughs> I'm just making it up. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> right, so there's, there's, there's still, still a few questions here. How are you feeling? 
I feel great. I love that much better than the talk, to be honest. Okay. All right then. So we'll so we'll try and get through these last ones then. So someone just wants to clarify that you mentioned the pico pack comes with two dressings. Yeah. If exigate is on the lower side. Is it able to be only changed once weekly, or the two dressings are both to be used in one week period? No, no, you don't have to. No, leave it in place. The less you change it, the better. For the C sections, for example, we leave that in place for a week. We love it. Just don't change it. I always say no wound is ever healed by looking at it. All right. So leave it alone. This is a sealed, sterile, wonderful environment. If there's no indication, uh, that you need to change it, leave it alone. You don't need to, um, you don't need to uh, um, change it twice a week. Unfortunately, what happens, you end up with hundreds of those dressings because the company is quite clever. They actually, the pump in itself cuts off after a week. Okay, they put a chip in there and after a week, the, 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 the pump just is useless and you have to throw it out. So the batteries are still good. You still got a dressing, but you haven't got a pump. So you need to buy another one. They've got to make the money somehow, you know, eh? <laughs> well, yes. It's a game, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and so someone just clarifying, would you only use short stretch compression with Pico? We Probably short stretch is 90% of our wound, of our compression bandaging. It's probably a reflective what's happening around the world. Uh, we have, we do use sure, sure press or long stretch. Uh, it doesn't really make any difference. Thank you. Right, you've got three to go. You're on the countdown now. Would <laughs> negative pressure wound therapy be effective for wounds with lymphatic leaks? Thank you. That's a tricky question. Who, whose question was that? Um, anyway, so it doesn't matter. Oh. No, it doesn't matter. I'm just kidding. Um, so, to be honest, my short answer is no. But that's just might be very personal. I like to really discuss it in a wider war forum because I haven't had much success with negative pressure on lymphatic uh, lymph uh, lymph problems. So what we often do, and we tried it many times, it just doesn't stop for some reason. If it stops very quickly, that's fine, but we hardly ever get that. So my, my advice usually is we use, a, um, we use a colostomy bag or a drainage bag and put that on because um, the lymphatic system will heal itself and it will settle down and it will take a while and nothing much we can do about it. It might take three or four weeks, but um, it just takes Let's just say it takes at least the same time, and you get a lot of problems with uh, with uh, um, maceration and other things. So we don't, on the whole, use negative pressure on lymphatic uh, uh, lymph problems. Okay. Um, then someone's saying, "I just want to ask, what sort of interface is used to achieve good granulation wound bed for patients with negative pressure?" Um, with the wood pressure therapy. Yeah, okay. So as I said earlier on, uh, we don't use a lot of interfaces that are standard. So no interface is best to want the effect of negative pressure. Um, that's how it's designed, all right? It's effective. Uh, if we have issues like pain, we talked about that. So you use a, sl a, a, a lower, t um, low tear and dressing, like for example, adaptive or cuticerin or better even, Mipitel, these are silicon-based intermittent layers. They're not cheap, but okay, that's fine. If that is a problem and you decide that's fine, every time you use an intermittent layer, reduce the effectiveness of the system you're using. Uh, we also at times use um, Acticode or silver dressing um, on the wound bead. Uh, if we think there's a high bacterial load, um, at times. So um, these are the uh, yeah, interface things we use. Okay. And then just to, just to clarify again, so if the wound cavity is necrotic and sloppy, 
does this become a contraindication for use of PICO? Absolutely. So uh, uh, if you have slough or necrotic uh, tissue sitting on the wound bead, uh, then we uh, would debride it uh, first. Now, on a whole, all right, uh, certainly that uh, should be debrided. The wound bead preparation is a different talk, but it's uh, what it, you know, is. And uh, what we sometimes do, we they say, we accept some slough and, you know, some people say 30%, some people say 20%, all right. Some slough is fine. Negative pressure is not a desloughing um, a debridement agent, okay. Vera, um, Vera flow and still is. So we see Vera flow and still as a debridement tool. And I think that's the best promise in that area. But um, what you can do with, um, with slough and negative pressure is you can use some gel, hydrogel, and put, put that first onto the slough and then apply the negative pressure, the wound filler. That has some effect, all right, but uh, it will take time. Thank you. Well, everyone's come flooding in. You've got heaps of people saying how impressed they were with your presentation, oh, how really? much they loved your knowledge, loved your experience, great refreshers. <laughs> um, you had people from the Cook Islands, you had St. John's, student nurses, GPs, nurses, nurse practitioners. Wow. Yeah, you reached out far and wide. Well done. Fantastic effort. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you out there. God bless you all. I really enjoyed it. And um, it's great to do that um, to the whole world. That's amazing. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Is that Mary from the Cook Islands? Come back again. Hello, Mary. <laughs> Hi, Mary. I love the Cook Islands. We can't wait to go to our talk. So, but there are two from the Cook Islands tonight. That's great. Good. Well, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. And thank you, Kathy, for the, the great moderation as well. I think it's time to say good night.